I'm super excited to introduce our next panel, which is focused on patients, and that's where it's all really about. So I'll let Candace take it away. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you, everybody. So hi there. Uh, my name is Candace Lerman, and I am a healthcare attorney, but also a rare disease patient. And I'm probably best known for uh, repurposing a drug twice to put my rare disease into remission. Uh, and after I did that, I decided to become an attorney and work in healthcare, mostly on a focus uh, for orphan drug development, uh, which is my passion. So I'm very excited to be here today. We have a fantastic, fantastic panel, and I want to thank everybody at One Up Health for, for putting this together. Uh, this is really fantastic, and since Hims was canceled, I was very disappointed because we have so many exciting things happening right now, especially this week. So I want to take some time to give everybody on the panel a chance to introduce themselves, but also to talk about their work, because everybody here has just such a, an amazing background and are involved with so many projects that help patients, truly. So by the time you get to the doctor and you need that care that we were just talking about and you disregard perhaps the privacy and security because you're looking for that treatment, these people are the ones to make it happen. So uh, I wanted to start off with someone who I view as like the godfather of e-patients and who, uh, when I started my journey as an advocate, I was uh, just so amazed by. And, and when I met him at uh, Health Data Palooza a couple weeks ago, I was just awestruck. Uh, e-patient Dave. So Dave, if you will uh, take it away and introduce yourself and talk about your work, I would really appreciate it. So thank you. I When you first started saying that, I didn't know who you were talking about. The uh, look. So I want to I want to get right into it because we have limited time here. Uh, Lanell, thank you for saying. Say one of our at least one of our speakers earlier today was a little bit sneering about patients don't know what they're going to get themselves into. All right, and that is paternalism in full voice. Sorry, honey, you don't understand. Don't touch that stove. Don't touch. Don't touch that data. All right, if it's my damn family that's in a crisis, as you heard earlier today about Seema Verma, the administrator of CMS, go talk with her if you wanna get paternalistic, okay? Now, as it happens, we in the movement, we've been at this for more than 10 years and we're a little bit fed up at people thinking they know better than us, okay? And so what I'm going to do is give you a glimpse, a short sort of slide presentation. I'm gonna to try to turn my other computer around here and pardon if this doesn't work out slick, but it's all going to be online uh, either later today or certainly by the end of the week, as you'll hear, because this is my best way. I'm a, as far as introducing myself, I almost died of stage four kidney cancer in 2009 or 2007. And when I didn't, I started looking at healthcare that saved my life. And I discovered that data wise, they have largely been really immature. Uh, I mean, immature in the sense of unsophisticated. And then I wrote a blog post about garbage in my medical record at Beth Israel Deaconess that landed me on the front page of the Boston Globe in 2009. Let me see if I can get this to work. Um, it's not gonna be ideal, but we'll see what we can. Okay, uh, so I ended up saying, give me my damn data. And this was my first keynote speech ever. It was an impulsive thing. Uh, it became a coffee mug. This is a social movement. And then Ross Martin and his gang of informatics people made it into a three minute rock video. Uh, it's a thing. Now, leading up to the ONC annual meeting, Morgan Gleason, who is a rare disease patient who has 23 patient portals. All right, paternalize that, you guys. Her data is scattered around 23 portals. She started putting together this letter that was posted on the blog of the Society for Participatory Medicine many patient stories. Uh, and in fact, in Dr. Rucker's presentation on Monday, he called out two of these presentations as examples of why we can't tolerate the current situation. Unblock Health is a new initiative uh, being started by Grace Cordovano, who spoke at that annual meeting. It's a patient story project. Patient story project is part of it. Our point here is harm can result when patients and care partners cannot see, collate, verify information about their cases. And I want people to understand, this isn't just a disservice to the sick person. It's when people say patient, they often have a big concept. It's the sick person, right? Uh, it is a disservice to the physician. You talk about physician burnout, 
Imagine busting your trained brain on something and then discovering that you were looking at wrong information, right? So good can result when patients do have the ability to see the data and be involved. And here are some specific stories. These are true stories that have been submitted to this project. And the, the story base, it's like the concept of emergence. A little bit of something is leading to more stories being submitted. The first and perhaps most famous is Regina Holliday's husband, who was denied pain medicine for his metastases and food for hours because his records hadn't moved over from the other hospital. Paternalize that. Well, you, I mean, this is pathetic to cause that much pain and suffering over a data transfer issue. Sue Sheridan's husband, Pat, died at age 45 because his pathology report saying that his tumor was malignant got misplaced, All right? Here's Morgan Gleason herself. Rare disease, 23 portals. No doctor has a comprehensive picture of her condition. How can any one of them do their perform to the top of their training? That's Morgan's mother, Amy. Three painful days, four sleepless nights with a kidney stone because her doctors had to go retrieve her records. This is suffering, all right? It's not a funny thing. Uh, meanwhile, also speaking today is Kristen Valdez. Uh, this is her daughter. Uh, couldn't get critical appointments until she laboriously pulled the records together. Adrian Gropper is one of the ones that Dr. Rucker, Rucker mentioned, caring for his elderly mother 200 miles away. He can't possibly, he's an MD, he can't possibly coordinate her care unless all the information is pulled together. Uh, Janice's mammogram showed an issue, but somehow she never found out that she was supposed to do follow-up. Her next mammogram was delayed. Bray Patrick Lake is a uh, just an incredible woman, used to be at Duke. She now works for Evidation. Uh, all her records are scattered. She had a few months ago a high speed rear end car accident uh, with her son in the car. And from experience, she declined ambulance transport and treatment because she knew that the hospital she was being taken to wouldn't have her is getting in the way of care. And of course, we have permission to share all these stories. The famous coffee mommy, an absolute goddess of breast cancer social media. Usually she has a smiling face, but look at this situation, right? When she had moved from Colorado to California, when she was first diagnosed in California with breast cancer, she wanted to get her records of a previous breast issue. They stalled and stalled and dragged feet. And eventually she was told that her records have been destroyed. All right, this is ludicrous. Here's Kristen, who will say more about her situation, I'm sure. And on and on it goes. This is a fabulous one. Uh, a friend of mine who prefers to go to, to stay anonymous went to a new doctor. She's a cardiac patient. And in the process of having to repeat her whole case again, she mentioned that the surgeon she was going to have had gotten arrested in the operating room. When somebody transcribed these, those notes, they wrote that she had arrested in the operating room which certainly would have changed the outlook for treatment. It's ridiculous we don't use computers to manage this information, but good can happen, all right? Uh, Betty had brought uh, records to MD Anderson. Uh, her doctor had FedEx records, but they'd gotten lost. But she had brought them, so she was able to go ahead with her treatment. This is my freaking mother. And this is where I start getting like visceral mad, all right? She went to a new doctor's office, had to repeat her whole history and some idiot added in there that she was diabetic, which she isn't. So the doctor was gonna schedule her for surgery, all right? I used to work in the typesetting industry. We have proofreaders, these people don't, all right? Uh, and on a completely separate thing, she had a successful hip replacement, she entered rehab, but they transcribed her thyroid condition backwards, hyper, hypo. The best doctor in the world could have done harm to her. Fortunately, my caregiver, caregiver daughters, the alpha sisters in the family said, could we check the chart? And they said yes, and they found the mistake. See, patient access can solve problems, right? Uh, and finally, Grace herself, right? She has to regularly check that her morphine allergy is in the provider's chart. It often isn't, 
okay? And then Morgan, the bright side of it, Morgan is now 21 and has matured into somebody who knows how to advocate for herself. When she moved hospitals to go to college, she brought along with her the protocol she and her doctors had developed. And because she had access to that to be able to print it, her next episode, her next hospitalization, they successfully avoided. All right, another episode of meningitis. I challenge anyone to justify. See, when people say, wait, 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 something bad might happen if the data gets out. Our point is something bad is already happening and good things are happening. Uh, for all I know, I'm at the end of my career, but this is what I want to leave the world with. And here's Grace on stage at the ONC national, national meeting talking, she set the place on fire, talking about how she, as a professional patient advocate, drives across state lines to get CDs with images that are necessary to schedule a second opinion. See, access to patient data makes a clinical difference. Real harm is happening now. Impeding access is unconscionable. And Grace has decided to take on this story collection and make it part later this week of her Unblock Health uh, website. So stay tuned. This is only the beginning. This is important work we're doing. I cannot bestow enough blessings on the people doing this policy work because we are finally, finally changing the reality. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dave. That was awesome and a great way to kick this off and, and show the voice of the patient and patient experience. So next, I want to move to Kristen, who, uh, when I read her daughter's story, I really connected because uh, I feel like my mom, when I was diagnosed, went through similar things. So Kristen, if you will uh, introduce yourself and your work and share your daughter's story as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to share that with you all quickly. Um, first of all, I have been a healthcare executive for nearly the last 20 years. So I live and breathe in this space. And when my daughter got sick, it took me seven years and a near fatal incident before finding her diagnosis. And I was the one who found it and I am not a clinician. I realized at that point that it was nearly impossible for even experts to navigate the healthcare delivery system when they needed to advocate for a family or a loved one. In my daughter's case, it was actually a very simple avoidable mistake, but she was six years old at the time and she was prescribed a secondary medication for a sinus infection, a routine procedure on a child. Um, at, or I would say routine treatment. The challenge was is that we were going through specialist after specialist after specialist trying to understand and get a diagnosis. She actually had had a formal diagnosis uh, the week prior. That diagnosis was not listed in her primary care record. It was listed only in the specialist record and therefore a medication was administered that made her body kill off all of its own blood platelets and she nearly bled internally to death. She was hospitalized for uh, well over a week trying to get her body to continue to manufacture platelets. And during that time, it took over six days for records to be accumulated from her 17 patient portals that don't talk to one another. They still don't talk to one another today. And so being able, these rules, uh, and I too commend all of the legislators and rule makers and all of the advocates that have been in the space working to make these happen, including the Karen Alliance, uh, E-Patient Dave, Devin, Ryan, all of those that are on the call today, because without that, we wouldn't have the ability to avoid these potential fatal mistakes that happen every day in our country. And let's not forget that medical error is still the third leading cause of death. And a good portion of that is due to missing or bad data. And that shouldn't be the case, not in an environment where we're as technically enabled as we are. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. And so you brought up the Karen Alliance. So Ryan, I'm so excited that you're here today. I've heard so much about you and so much about the Karen Alliance. So please introduce yourself and, and the Karen Alliance for all of us. Sure. Glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, Ryan Howells, I'm a principal at Levitt Partners. We also help lead the Karen Alliance, which is a multi-sector group of stakeholders trying to come together to release more data with less friction to patients. That is the primary goal. Uh, I, like you, am inspired by folks like Kristen and Devin and Dave and others and, and, and you, Candice, uh, as we're trying to make a way to happen for this to happen at scale around the country. Um, let me just quickly just, I'm going to spin through just a few slides here, just not very many, um, but I will say uh, 
we, we are primarily focused on uh, business to consumer data exchange. So we are not focused on this HIPAA box that you see up here. We are focused primarily on just getting the data out of that HIPAA box and actually moving it to an app of the consumer's choice. As Dave mentioned, and as we've talked to many consumer advocates, uh, they have been loud and proud with the idea that they can choose an app they can that is consistent with their own privacy preferences, and they want to be able to make that happen at scale. And so that is where our primary focus is. Um, we have a number of organizations participating in this. Um, we have seven of the largest 10 uh, health plans participating, um, uh, met nearly all of the consumer platform companies. We have all the EHR vendors, either directly or through their associations. Uh, a lot of different uh, uh, pharma companies and others. The goal here is to create a collaborative environment by which we can agree on how we're going to do this at scale. I will tell you that the folks that are involved in the Karen Alliance all rally around this one vision. They compete with each other in the marketplace very aggressively, I might add, but their goal is to find a way to actually get this information to the patient or caregiver when, where, and what, how they want to achieve their goals. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing um, in order to make that happen. First of all, um, as we know right now, when that data leaves HIPAA, it leaves that protected environment. And so while there are aggressive consumer and patient caregiver advocates out there like Dave and, and Grace and others that are doing that, we also need to try to find a way to protect that for the most vulnerable. Um, the way that we can do that, at least initially, is to find a way for the industry to gain consensus on how to develop a code of conduct so that conduct, that code can be enforceable by um, both public and private entities. We've done that. It's out there available for folks to use. It was referenced, thank you so much, CMS, in the CMS rule as being an option for health plans to actually use when the app actually comes in to attest to, their, uh, to, to the, the fact that they're following that. And it, what's great uh, about the code is it actually, it doesn't uh, recreate HIPAA outside of HIPAA. It actually expands and builds upon it. It finds a way to bring in uh, areas uh, like CCPA in California, the California Privacy Law, GDPR, for example, internationally, uh, and other things to be able to restrict, for example, downstream access of that data. So when an app is actually coming in and attesting to the code, they're saying we're going to actually restrict that downstream access to the data of that personally identifiable information without individual upfront consumer consent. Um, we're also working on two different APIs that um, uh, one of which was referenced actually in the CMS rule that just came out. One was the consumer directed payer data exchange available for all health plans to use now. It went through the balloting process in January with HL7 and we're reconciling those comments. But I know plans are actively looking at implementing that right now. And so we're excited about that. Uh, we're also implementing something called real-time pharmacy benefit check, which allows for patients to actually receive their formulary and benefit information, out-of-pocket costs, therapeutic alternatives, and cash price literally on an app of their choice. And that way patients can now say, I'm going to find the drug and work with my doctor to find the drug that's most efficacious for me, that's cheapest for me, whatever, they, whatever their personal preferences are, again, working with their physician, they can have now an informed dialogue with them, which they have not been able to have before in real time. And then finally, digital identity. This is a problem that's existed for a long time. Um, we only know who you are if you come into one organization system. That's how we know who you are. It's really hard for us to know who you are if in fact you come and present yourself to multiple systems. So back to Dave's point about Morgan and, and Kristen's point about her daughter having multiple portals. The issue there is that they have to present themselves and identify themselves every time they go to a portal. We don't wanna have to do that. We want actually the patients and the individuals to own their own identity credential. They wanna be identity proof one time. And if they could do that one time and own that for themselves and have that be personal to themselves and highly secure, they can then share that with whomever they'd like. They can actually share that with their health plan. They can share that with their provider. They can share that with their third party app. And they are the ones who are actually in control. That's called a digital federation identity credential that can actually be provided. 
So we're doing a lot of uh, fun things. We've got a lot of connectathons coming up. Um, one is in San Antonio at HL7. One's uh, our Karen community meeting in Detroit, and we'll get this information out to the group. Um, I did want to share three other quick things uh, with you, Candace. Number one, look at all this data, Dave. This is USCDI version one. This is so exciting because this is now required by law related to individual EHR vendors that are certified to be able to provide that. And look what we get. We get those clinical notes, which so many people have wanted for so long. By the way, I now have a story about my brother. Uh, and everyone's going to laugh on this call who's there because I have not had a story in the four years that we've been working on this. I now have a story. My brother, who is a disabled veteran, had to find a way in which he could actually pay for an emergency visit that obviously he was not expecting. And he went through a significant issue for him personally about trying to go through this process. Well, during the course of that event, when he presented himself to a local hospital system. He said, look, I've got the VA. And they said, that's fine. We'll coordinate with the VA. We'll get the VA to pay for this. You won't have to pay for a thing. And they, uh, he, he got their verbal consent that that's what they were going to do. Well, guess what? He actually got a huge bill and uh, they, they charged him for all of this work that they, he had done at the local hospital system, even though they were going to coordinate with the VA. But they did something very interesting. Um, they actually recorded in the notes that they were going to coordinate with the VA. And when they actually in included that in the notes, that they were on the hook to make that happen. Well, my brother, with the help of my mom and with the help of me, actually did not realize that that was the case. I said, you got to find the notes, mom, because she was helping my brother. Go find the notes and figure this out. She found the notes. She found the actual note that said they were going to coordinate with the VA. You know how long it took him to fix that problem? 72 hours, not only did he get all of that wiped off as far as the amount of money that he had to pay, now it's zero, but in addition, he got his credit back to where it needed to be so he could refinance his house and do some things to his home that he needed to from a financial perspective. So yay for clinical notes, open notes that started this whole process. We're excited about that. Uh, here's the timeline. I think others have talked about this more than likely uh, for all of this stuff and, and when it's going to be rolled out. I think what's interesting is this, what they call EHI export capability. This is incredibly important and so exciting because within three years of the date of the final publication of the rule, not only are you going to get all of those data elements I just mentioned, you're going to get the entire designated record set on a, what's called a hyperlink. So literally within the click of a button, you're going to get all of the designated record set, again, with the ONC rule within 36 months of the published, final publication. That is how they define EHI in these new rules, which is also incredibly exciting too. Uh, standards, by definition, have not been laid out as to how they're going to do that. That's okay. But it, uh, digitally um, had information. And then this is the last slide, Candice, which is the CMS rule. We're excited about that because if you mentioned you would like to get your claims information, you can do that through the Patient Access API on January 1st of 2021. And not only for your commercial and Medicare business, but also for Medicaid. So even the most vulnerable among us can be able to access all their information, including dual eligibles, to gain all of that information to the, an app of their choice to find out ways to make that happen. Whether or not the state Medicaid procurement laws can actually get this there that fast, we'll have to figure that out, but we're gonna try to find a way, we're working behind the scenes actually to try to make that happen. Provider directory, imagine knowing who your provider is and what they are, that, that's a long overdue problem that we're trying to solve. Pair to pair data exchange, five year look back. It means you can now take five years worth of your claims history and through your authorization, route that information over to your next health plan um, uh, to make that happen. And then, uh, and then uh, mission discharge and transfer, what they call ADT feeds. This is now what's called a condition of participation. It means that when you are discharged from a hospital and you're transferring to another institution, by law, you're, that hospital is required to notify that new institution, whether it be long-term care or skilled nursing, of that discharge. They have not done that before, and for competitive reasons, they've not wanted to do that before. They're now required 
as a what's called condition of participation, which means they won't get Medicare or Medicaid money if they don't do it uh, to make this happen. So that's also super exciting with these CMS rules. So Candace, with that, I'll stop and go from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was really great and some fantastic information. And last but not least, Devin, I'm so excited when I saw your name and said, oh my gosh, she's on the panel. This is fantastic. Uh, please introduce yourself. And just a funny story, I have followed you on Twitter for quite a while. Um, and, and so I was very excited about this because of course, when these rules dropped, I was on Twitter reading everything that everybody had to say. So you have some fantastic insight to give us. So take it away. Oh, thank you, Candace. Thank you so much. I, um, you know, I'm pretty excited about um, what these new rules will do for patients when they finally get implemented. Um, you know, the ability to choose an app, you know, on your phone or on your computer and be able to tap into all of the uh, places where you've gotten care and be able to get that data and also to be able to tap into a health plan record and remind yourself of where you've gotten care, right? Because for, I think for a lot of people, they don't necessarily remember all the physicians that they saw. They were sick when it happened. So the ability to sort of take that claims record and say, oh, here's my, the breadcrumb trail of all the places where I've been. So I now know um, where I need to go get uh, my records and I can tap in, uh, use my app to tap into all of those places and get it all consolidated in one place. So then when I want to share it, when I want to use it, and then when I want to share it, it's, a, it's all in one place. Uh, and I can augment it ideally with information from me, um, you know, whether it's my mood or my pain levels, or even just, you know, well, I know that medication is in my medical history and it was prescribed for me, but I didn't like it. And so I stopped taking it and I'm not taking it anymore, or it was too expensive. So I don't take it anymore. So this sort of combination of what's in the clinic in all of the clinical records, as well as what the patient's own experience is, is really powerful stuff. And it's a long time in coming. And so it's, it's sort of exciting to see um, that we're finally going to be at this place. But I want to take a moment to remind folks that even before we got to the point where we needed additional law to sort of force the issue in terms of automating patients access, we had HIPAA. Um, and so patients have always had the right to get their records from anywhere where they have received care, assuming that that provider was covered by HIPAA, which is the case in most places, but that it was really hard for people to do that. These rules should make it much easier, but Ryan showed that timeline really quickly on the screen. They've got two years to, to put the um, application programming interfaces into place all throughout the country so that it's capable for your um, app or service to be able to get records from anywhere that you've gotten care, right? And, and that, so that's one thing, a couple of years. And then the EHI export that Ryan talked about where all the data um, becomes available and not just the data that's on that list that he showed can get exported to you. That's another third year um, out. Um, so I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. This is, this is great. Three years is actually not that long, right? Given how long we've waited to get to this point. But in the meantime, you know, you, we've got people out there, people like yourself, people like the, the cancer patients that we work with who need their records today to get second opinions, to be able to get, um, uh, see if they qualify for clinical trials. And that's where the HIPAA rules and, and frankly, some of the work that the Office of the National Coordinator did uh, previously regarding patient portals and view, download, and transmit, and secure messaging, there still is the possibility today that you get your records. And what we're seeing, um, we do a scorecard, actually, where we rate how well healthcare providers are responding to records requests. And we've had, this is on our website. Um, you know, we're citizen, C-I-I-T-I-Z-E-N.com. We have a scorecard. You can go right to our website and see it and see how well providers are responding to requests for records. We have not updated that scorecard since November, but we're preparing for another update. And the improvements are dramatic. They're dramatic. And, and I think this is important to note that I think this culture around the right of patients to get their data is changing. The new, the, the new rules are forcing it. The fact that the Office for Civil Rights is enforcing HIPAA, the fact that more and more patients are saying, hey, give me my damn data, in the words of Dave, 
um, is really starting to make a difference, I think, um, in how patients are able to access their data. So we've got you know, so many great things to look forward to, but the environment is changing today, you know, even where people don't have that API access that they will have in the near future. So um, I know you all, you all wanted to also talk about sort of these privacy issues that come when, you know, you're using an app to get your data, but I'm, I'm gonna stop and see Candace, how you want to have an interplay among us because we haven't had a chance to really take questions and dialogue, but we can certainly talk about that issue and others. So thanks, thanks for the opportunity. So thanks so much for all the great information. So I'm happy everybody sort of laid out some of the topics and, and some of the big ideas around this. But I wanted to circle back to Kristen because one of the issues that I saw when I was talking about these new rules earlier this week and chatting about it online was a lot of uh, patients and, and parents were like, well, so what? So it kind of got me thinking that while we're sitting here and we're excited because we're involved with this and we live it, a lot of patients are just managing and caregivers too, day-to-day -day life. And, and so you're just trying to get from point A to point B. So Kristen, because you you live this and you work in this and this is, this is your ecosystem, what do you suggest are ways that we can go about either as advocates or as companies in this space or uh, just... Uh, in general, working in this environment, how can we educate patients and patient communities on the importance of this, uh, incorporating it into a, perhaps a business model or a structure and also into advocacy? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, in what we've seen in terms of serving, consumers largely do not understand HIPAA. They know that it's a form they sign off on, you know, in the doctor's office, they know that their data is supposed to be secure. But we find that if you ask somebody, you know, do you want to share information, let's say with your health insurer to support a claim, they're going to say, absolutely not. Little do they know that that data is actually transmitted under HIPAA in a big black box all the time. So consumers largely don't know and understand where their data is uh, coming from or coming to. And I think it's our job to educate them. But in our experience, it's not just about access to the data, because if you're a healthy individual and you gain access to your data, you're thinking, great, here's my data but there's no action that's derived from that. There's no information, right? So data needs to turn into information. And one of the things that we really advocate for is while we don't wanna take anything away from this monumental shift that we just had with these rules, that we neglected to actually also make mandatory the tools that would allow for access to be easier, for understanding to be easier. So it's when you look at someone's data and let's say they download a third party application, we happen to be a trusted third party application. When we consume someone's data on their behalf, we don't just show them their data, that's part of what we do, but we also help run all of the algorithms and analytics around evidence-based medicine guidelines. Because we don't come out of the womb with a book that says, hey, when you're 50, you need to get a colonoscopy. But by the way, you know, if you have a family health history, you may need to go earlier. And in fact, the guidelines are now regularly changing. And as consumers, we don't actually sit around Googling the internet going, man, I wonder when I should have a colonoscopy or wait for that you know, phone call that says, hey, happy birthday. It's time for you to schedule that colonoscopy, right? They also don't know that if they're not at risk, they may not have to go in for a full procedure that they can do an FDA approved toilet water test at home and might prefer that. So as consumers, we need to create more of an easy button that says, hey, this is time for you to do something. And we're going to make that easy for you. Let me schedule that appointment for you. But all these APIs that we're talking about with these three-year timelines don't enforce EMRs creating APIs, which they already have. They don't make them public for things like scheduling. So mobile applications can't easily say, it's time for you to do this. Now let me schedule you the service. Oh, and by the way, here's what it's going to cost. And here's where you are to your out-of-pocket max or deductible. How would you like to receive this? Would you like this in home? Would you like this in office? Would you like this virtually through telehealth? All of those things are possible today, but it takes a lot of work and effort for us to create those experiences. So I don't think we've gone far enough and I'm really excited to see what the Karen Alliance takes on next to make the consumer experience and data available. Awesome, thank you for that. So I wanna open up that question to the rest of you too, um, because I think one of the, the big challenges we have in healthcare overall is health literacy. And how do we explain to different groups of people, whether they're we're talking to patients directly or we're talking to caregivers and perhaps we're talking to parents of children, but what about um, young adults who are caring for elderly parents as well? 
what, how are we going to explain that these rules and the opportunities that are going to be afforded to access uh, data a lot easier, especially for folks who perhaps have spent decades fighting just to get a simple medical record so they can bring it to their new doctor? Go for it, Dave. I see you raising your hand. <laughs> well, so from the very beginning, all the way back in 2009, what I called for and the reason I decided to send my data, the, the way I discovered I had junk in my medical record at Beth Israel was that my hospital announced that they had this new interface to Google Health. Uh, we're not the one that exists today, but a really old thing. And I thought, I don't trust Google at all. I mean, the Google company, the Google company had just caved into the Chinese government and all of that. But I thought, and you know, in my previous industry in graphic arts, we had an explosion of innovation when the data got loose out of the big vendors and into the hands of the consumers through this thing called desktop publishing. You know, and us paternal people in the graphic arts said, no, children, you don't know how to use fonts. You don't know what you're doing. You'll make ugly pages. It was exactly <laughs> the same. And it happened, you know? We said like, you can't handle the Helvetica, right? And the, and people, <laughs> but, but a really important thing happened, okay? People were clueless about fonts because they had never touched one, all right? And when they got their hands on fonts, now we're at the point where people humiliate each other for using Comic Sans, all right? That's gotten woven into our culture. But really importantly, now that there was a market a thousand times bigger of font users and page makers, right? New apps and plugins and workflows developed that were easier for the clueless people. And this is exactly what we're gonna see. This is why, for instance, I have a Wi-Fi bathroom scale. I have, various, I have a, a Fitbit and an Apple Watch at the moment because I'm part of that new heart trial that Apple's running and all of that, the graphs that they have of my data are a thousand times better than what I have at Beth Israel Deaconess, all right? So it is a, it's actually a mental error to think, oh my gosh, people aren't gonna be able to handle this because this is what I said back in 2009, 2010, when I first started speaking in Washington was to innovators, data is fuel. Now, Quicken and Mint.com would produce no value if they couldn't get at the bank and credit card data through APIs, all right? And so this is, I am eager to see companies like Kristen's, for instance, start doing with our health data, including finding there will become a market for people who know how to explain complicated stuff clearly. Hallelujah, yeah. right? Now- Absolutely. And- I tell you what, people say, but old people don't know blah, blah, blah. Or, well, you know, last month I turned 70, all right? I'm five years into Medicare. Old isn't what it used to be, all right? Sometime this month, I'm gonna hit 40,000 Twitter followers. I'm sorry, people. And I, so what do I have? 70 year old me has this shirt from Mitre Corp. Own your health data, all right? We're going to talk to each other. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'll let other people talk, but don't hold back. Yeah, I, I, I would just say that, you know, what, what Kristen is doing for the users of Be Well is amazing. You know, we're serving mostly cancer patients right now. And so we're developing, you know, basically summaries for them so that their data has kind of a, like a face sheet or an executive summary to a larger narrative about where they are um, with respect to cancer that highlights, you know, here's your diagnosis, here are the, um, you know, here is the relevant genomic or genetic marker if you've got one, here is your tumor size, here are the treatments you have been on, here's whether they were successful or not. Because, you know, for any one particular patient, there's just pages and pages and pages of data. Um, it needs to be organized, it needs to be graphically presented. So it's like, where am I a relative, you know, relative to other patients of the same 
cancer and that gives people tools, but, but all we needed really was the data to make this happen, right? And, and we will all ultimately compete in the marketplace for who provides a user experience that is valuable to people. But, um, but as Dave mentioned, without the data, you can't, you can't do any of that. So now that we're getting to the point of being able to get that data and to be able to get it you know, seamlessly as opposed to trudging through mud, which is what it sometimes feels like today, um, you know, we, the opportunities are just really quite endless, really. Well, and imagine a world where, you know, every one of our covered patient populations, because we are, we're really for the consumer, we're for everyone, the healthy, the sick, the old, the young, we believe we don't need to sort people out by demographics any longer in health the way we always have. But when someone has a diagnosis of cancer and they come into our population, the referrals that we can make to citizen to say, did you know that there's help out there? There are half a million digital health applications out on the cloud, and those numbers are growing rapidly. And when you think about all of the great solutions like what Citizen can offer, consumers don't know about them. So we play a role not just on the integration of the data and helping people understand, but also then connecting them to trustworthy sources and third parties that we call point solutions. So when it's applicable to an individual, that it's relevant information being presented to them. Because for too long from a health perspective, we talked about education being missing and literacy being low. I mean, it's 4%, it, it's, it couldn't get much lower. But we tell everyone that they need to sleep more and walk more and eat less and you know be gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free or whatever free that you might be. But the reality is that consumers don't actually know because we've never given them their own data and allowed healthcare to be personalized. And it needs to be personalized, not just for patients, which obviously are extremely complicated and need uh, and all, not only all of their data, but they need to be able to advocate for themselves and protect their families and their loved ones. I mean, I'm a mama bear like there's no other mama bear and I don't plan to stop that job any other time time soon. But we also need to take the person who may not know that they're overdue for preventative services and or might be trending in the wrong direction. When lab data comes to you, it's a point in time data for a lab. You don't even know what part of the body is measuring. Show someone a trend line that they're heading in the wrong direction towards a disease they don't want, and they're going to be able to take action. So to Devin's point and Dave's point and Ryan's point, access to the data allows us to be able to provide these services and really change the face of health. And I know Ryan wants to say something. I can see it in his face. <laughs> yeah, I always, as you know, I always like to say something. I, but I, amen to everything that's been said. I just would say, Candace, I think we envision a world. I want to go back to Dave's point. What we say is you're not going to get paid now whether you have the data. You're going to get paid on what you do with the data and how you make that applicable to patients and providers. That's what is going to be the future of healthcare. And what's really exciting about this, in my view, is that we've, we've dumped, well, not we, but the venture capital community has dumped almost $8 billion a year into healthcare IT and largely have not received that return primarily because you don't get the person-specific information across these portals that you need in order to make better decisions. What's going to happen now and what could happen in the future, we're not there yet, but we will be here over the next few years, is you're going to see actually apps go at risk to show that they can actually provide better outcomes than the healthcare organizations themselves. So when you move to a value-based care environment and you can move in an aggressive approach, these apps can now go at risk to say, look, how about this? Why don't you just give us some money we're going to take that money and we're actually going to go forward and yield far better outcomes than you could actually receive as an organization themselves. And as a result of that, they'll be able to, to, to partake in the good that everyone's incentives align now. We're all incented, hopefully, to get to a point when as we move forward with value-based care where this can, and now the digital economy is now incented in a similar way as providers are being incented by CMS and by the commercial sector. That's where we wanna to get to. How do we keep everybody healthy rather than um, have this sick-based infrastructure that we have today? Some excellent points. And I think uh, one thing that uh, I kind of thought of uh, during the course of this discussion is that 
uh, as a patient with multiple conditions, I have to see multiple doctors. So perhaps um, because I have a rare blood disorder, I see a hematologist, but I also have Sjogren's syndrome. So I see a rheumatologist. Neither of those doctors want to take responsibility or discuss the other condition. So I am stuck with having to ultimately kind of compile my data into two separate pieces. So one of the really fantastic things about these new laws and, and about what we're discussing here is the ability for me to be able to possibly put some data it together and, and tie it in a pretty bow and give it to my hematologist. So if we're going to, let's say, use a treatment uh, for my rare blood disorder, we may be able to find a treatment that also treats the stroke and syndrome at the same time, but the doctors are not in the same health system. They're not able to technically communicate with each other. And the like elephant in the room for patients are, we get a 15 minute increment with the doctor who has to sit in front of a computer and type up a bunch of information while we're talking to them. So what do we see perhaps is the future of using some sort of the of app and application and even wearables as Dave is pointing out to help sort of streamline that doctor's visit for patients so that when we only get that 15 minute increment, which is a whole different battle than what we're talking about here, we can maximize every second in front of a provider. I Go for it, Dave. Uh, no, I'm, I'm going to very quickly tack something onto that previous discussion. Uh, there is a particular structural problem in the American healthcare system, which is the intermediary, right? The person between the provider of service and the, uh, and, and the person with the need. That, that factor, uh, outcomes tend to get measured, among other things, by how much they reduce the cost of care. But it, in every case, it's somebody else other than the person with the problem defining what's a, an outcome worth following. And I just want to point, for those who aren't aware of it, to look what happens when the person with the problem doesn't need the intermediary anymore. The way, the place you look for that is open APS, the artificial pancreas people who have created their own treatment and one of the amazing things that they have discovered is that they have outcomes that nobody has ever been interested in. For instance, the people who use this open source device that they created, they sleep better. Now, who would have ever sought research funding to create something that would help people with type one diabetes sleep better? But see, that's where when autonomy the ability to create your own future gets into the hands of the person with the problem. So remember that for the future. I'm done. So I so I want to add on to that um, to the to those great points and also address your question a little bit, which is you know, one of the things that we've discovered, and Kristen can probably um, chime in on this too, is that when we show the data summary for a cancer patient to an oncologist, they look at it and say, "Wow." I didn't have to click through a bunch of screens to get this all on mm -hmm. one page where I can see it. And yet I also can see where all this information came from so I can trust it. I wish all my patients had this. I think we on the consumer side are designing our tools for use by patients and the providers who are caring for them to meet clinical needs. And a lot of times the tools that the um, providers are using were designed to meet other needs, clinical needs plus payment needs. So consequently, there's a there's sometimes um, in terms of the interface or the ease of use, there's a lot of time that the clinician has to spend, you know, typing, looking at the screen, as opposed to you come in, you've got your phone or you've got your mm -hmm. laptop, and you say, hey, here's here's my data, here here's what's going on with me. They're like, oh. Well, it's all right here. I don't have to click in a bunch of places. I can see immediately. And then we can spend the rest of the 13 minutes, because that only took two, to talk about what's going on with you and, and work with you and come up with a care plan, et cetera. So and I, I support that completely. The other thing I would add to give some hope um, based on your ask, Candace, is that the health systems that we are working with that are um, deploying BeWell as an enterprise product are really looking to solve that problem. Uh, and they're in a very big way, as well as go to value-based care and take new kinds of risk. So we're seeing that they're doing things that let's say airlines have done forever, like advanced checking people in, doing the med rec before they walk in the door, not filling out the God awful form at the you know, check-in you know, area. But at the same time, consumers then remember that all these new rules are great in terms of getting data out 
they don't do anything about pushing data in. And that's a challenge. So with the technology standard that, that we leverage with our clients, they're willing to open up those EMRs and allow us to push data in. So to Devin's point, they see the whole picture at the time of care and they're not spending half their 15 minutes trying to figure out where have you been? What have you done? What is your history? Um, and questioning you typing fearlessly and madly into their EMR system. Them, but they're actually able to address you and indicate how can I serve you better, but also doing a better job at knowing why you're coming in in the first place, triaging you to the right doctor at the right level of care that will ultimately not only save users on their out-of-pocket cost, but make the system more efficient overall. So I would say the cavalry is coming. We're seeing some really good health systems leaning into consumerism in healthcare. Um, and I think you'll be excited by the movement that's made here pretty quickly over the next couple of years. Great. So um, we have about uh, nine minutes left. So I wanted to see um, perhaps if uh, if uh, Doug and Christina maybe have uh, some questions from people watching. Yes, um, yeah. we, we certainly do. We have a couple. Christina's got the first one. Yeah, so we've noticed that there's a lot of hesitancy between patients to actually share their medical data, especially with apps that they might not be as familiar with. So we wanted to know if you guys have any ideas on how to actually break down those barriers um, and kind of open that up. Well, I, Christina, it's not a universal panacea, but it's one service we're gonna offer, which uh, thanks to the help with 1UP Health and the pro bono development work that they're gonna do, we are going to publish a site here uh, very shortly. It's not live yet, so you'll see something ugly up there now, but it's called myhealthapplication.com. And it's vendor and platform agnostic. It literally just shows a list of all of these great sites like Citizen and BeWell and others, these great applications, I should say, and 1UP Health as well. All of these uh, applications who now can gain access to the information and the data uh, on behalf of patients. And so it also very clearly outlines the privacy policy and their terms and conditions so that folks are searching for that information, but they can actually get that up front so they can choose an app that's for their benefit. But that's one way we're doing it. And I know there's others. Yeah, I would only add, you know, the rules um, opened up the possibility for um, healthcare providers and also vendors to provide some education um, to uh, patients about um, the policies of apps. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. You know, I, um, uh, Kristen and I are both, um, our companies are members of the Karen Alliance. So we, we feel pretty strongly that the code of conduct like hits all the right measures in terms of, you know, what every app should really be willing to attest to. Um, but it, but there, it's not the only code out there. So it'll be interesting to see whether there's kind of, um, hopefully a, a kind of coalescing around one set of tools that that consumers can really understand and rely on versus a cacophony of, of stuff out there. But we'll, we'll see how this plays out um, over the next couple of years. But I love, um, and thanks, really great thanks to 1UP Health for sort of hosting along with the Karen Alliance, you know, this platform where people can go really pretty immediately um, to see what apps have attested to this code of conduct and where you can find them. So it's helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, and also thank you all of you for being such great patient advocates. Um, and then the last one is actually interesting. Um, in the interest of facilitating um, patient sharing, there's also a movement that we see um, for uh, creating a universal kind of patient ID. Devin, I think that's what you were talking to. And um, there, there are pros and cons. Uh, today, the system is built on knowing your passwords per system. Um, and people are, are just getting, uh, it's early days of that. And so there's, it, people view that as a friction, um, uh, but then a universal patient ID uh, solves some problems and uh, has raises some other concerns. Uh, I thought um, you all of all people would have uh, strong opinions about those and um, might give us some insights. Uh, Kristen, uh, I see you smiling. Do you wanna 
give your I opinion. I was on. smiling because I was watching Ryan's face because I know it's one of his favorite topics. <laughs> so <laughs> I was waiting to see his reaction right, well, and if he jumped in. So I'm going to let Ryan go first. Give it to you. Yeah. I've even got a slide on it. How do you like that? So um, uh, look, uh, the, the answer is, um, look, we had a universal patient ID. It was called a social security number and it didn't work out very well, right? So, um, and that, by the way, that was Don Rucker saying that, not me. Um, but um, what I will say is that the um, industry has evolved since that point. Let me just say from a political perspective, it's gonna be a while before we get a universal patient ID in the US, if ever. That's kind of point number one. Point number two is the industry has evolved to a point where actually now we have a situation where um, individuals through the Real ID system and other things can get what's called a digital credential. And that digital credential, which includes a number of identifiers, could then be able to be taken and used across multiple different entities, providers and health plans to validate you are who you say you are. It's far more secure, it's standards-based, and it's the ability to be truly portable at scale. And so, and that is actually implemented in production today and can be used today. We don't have to wait for any policy on that. We can actually use that today. We're trying to find ways to scale that within healthcare. So yes, as Kristen mentioned, it is it is exciting and, and we're working on some ways to make that happen within Karen and hopefully you'll see that over the next few months and years. Super helpful. And, um, and we've seen that um, the VA's adopted IDME. Um, it's one click access and I, I think that's a lot of, uh, as you mentioned with Don, a lot of what um, Don wanted in terms of freeing up um, uh, once we have an API economy. Yeah, great. Um, any parting words for you all? Um, uh, you're a very distinguished panel. Candice, you wanna wrap us up? Yes, just wanted to say uh, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, and, and joining us today for a very dynamic discussion. A huge, huge thank you to One Up Health for doing this. I know that it was probably stressful and crazy in a whirlwind to throw this together, uh, but this is, this is amazing. And I have to say, I'm so impressed at how smooth this runs because there's people that plan this kind of stuff for months and it just falls apart. So kudos to you. It goes to show how fantastic you are. Um, and I think Dave wanted to give you a quick shout out about something. So I want him to, to chime in here real quick and, and give a thank you as well. Yeah, and, and I think a shout out to 1UP Health, not just for hosting this uh, is appropriate. It's about their product. The, one of the first things I learned about FIRE two years ago was a guy named Mike Morris, a cancer patient who I talked to a little, a couple of months before he died. He was getting treated at four different hospitals familiar story. Even though they were all Epic users, none of them could talk to each other. And using 1UP Health, he was a programmer, so he's an early indicator of what will be possible. Using 1UP Health, he pulled together the data from all four hospitals, and every visit with any one of them started with him presenting the case to the doctors, which is the opposite of the usual. This is the world you know, open APIs enabling people putting together data presentations that suit the immediate case, the world that we're entering because of these new regulations. Thanks Thank to all of you, it's just awesome, wonderful. Yeah, I think Thank everybody you. today is first class and we're all working towards the same end. And Mike is a, is a huge um, inspiration for us. His brother is continuing his legacy. So thank you all. And um, uh, we will continue to make things better. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you.